presentation to send us uh, an email um, at FERC or kwade at unb.ca and, and that those comments will also be forwarded to the hiring committee. As uh, the advertisement for this presentation indicated, this is part of the hiring process for a new associate director at the MMFC and we really value your feedback on the presentation. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Nicole Wallet. Nicole is our, our presenter this morning. Nicole has a Bachelor of Neuroscience from Dalhousie University and a Master's of Social Work from McGill. During her graduate studies, Nicole specialized in trauma-informed community development. She has experience as a participant in Canada World Youth, working in a women's shelter with the ISD program on youth mental health here in the province. She currently works with the New Brunswick Military Family Resource Center and in private practice. Nicole has experience working with individuals and couples. She's given guest lectures at the St. Thomas University Social Work Program on topics which include intimate partner violence and trauma and attachment. Nicole is working currently towards certification in emotionally focused therapy for couples in hopes of further supporting couples and families living with trauma in an effective and meaningful way. And so Nicole's presentation this morning is titled Shame and Family Violence, A Paradigm Shift. I'm gonna turn my mic off. And if you have any problems with Zoom, please feel free to message me privately. Nicole, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, being here with me today as uh, we embark on a discussion about shame and family violence. Donc, je veux remercier tout le monde d'être ici aujourd'hui. Uh, sorry, there's just things popping up here. Um, d'être ici aujourd'hui pour parler de la honte et la violence familiale. So I just want to start us off by kind of talking about where the spark um, for this presentation came from. And it actually began um, at the very beginning of my social work career when I was working in a shelter for victims of violence. So part of my role there was um, to offer supportive counseling and psychoeducation. So my background was actually um, in a feminist framework where family violence is understood within the context of gender and power. So um, within this framework, um, tactics of abuse and control uh, can be understood um, as the use of privilege to um, further oppress marginalized populations, so in this case, uh, women. So I just want to start us off kind of with a really brief overview of this background. So on your left of the screen, you will see the wheel, I think it's the left for you guys, uh, the wheel of power and control. Uh, and so this is kind of has its roots um, in the feminist framework um, where men use power and control to dominate um, and, and oppress women. And then on the right, of the screen um, is kind of the evolution of this ideology, um, but through a lens of intersectionality. So understanding um, that it is about a power differential um, within a bunch of different categories and pieces of identity, not just gender, but that gender is a piece of that. Um, and also looking at it in terms of not just relational, um, but also in terms of greater systemic variables, so in social settings and broader societal forces. So I think it's really important um, that we understand where it has come from because it has been really important in the advancement of um, women's rights, as well as our understanding of power and privilege and oppression. Um, but I do want to talk about how um, this background has kind of led to three um, dominant ideologies. Donc, commence à mener à trois idéologies dominantes. Um, which are that victims are a class of people distinct from perpetrator, que les victimes sont une classe de personnes distinct des auteurs, that change for perpetrators is unlikely and not, not often worth the effort. Donc le changement pour les auteurs est peu probable et ne vaut souvent pas la peine. That engagement with perpetrators is dangerous and therefore best left to the state, and that uh, donc que l'engagement avec les auteurs est dangereux et il vaut donc mieux les laisser à l'état. So I wanna bring us a little bit into current culture um, and into society and look at how these ideologies kind of impact um, 
how we look at family violence and perpetrators of violence within society and especially um, within the media. So what we often see is this narrative of the perpetrator um, as a monster. Um, and there's also kind of this grappling um, in terms of the classification between perpetrator and victim. So this idea of we thought we knew someone um, and then we come to know of their abuse and um, how it's kind of difficult to reconcile these two pieces together. And if we look to current events in terms of um, the killings that happened in Nova Scotia recently, the papers were really filled with this narrative of looking at different pieces of his identity, how people had understood him prior to these acts of violence, and then how they were then kind of reclassifying him um, and their response to that. Uh, so, what happens in terms of this is that once we've kind of grappled with it and recategorized the person um, in terms of this monster narrative, um, our responses are quite swift to be one of condemnation, to be persecution, um, and to, for also calls to justice. Um, and so we have this sense that we thought he was a good man um, and now we can see the violence and the abuse. And so we have this sense that we were somehow mistaken or deceived by him. And this makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, our minds have evolved to categorize things into either or black or white and things which don't fit neatly um, into categories are, are difficult to manage. It creates a lot of cognitive dissonance. And um, the people who actually have to really grapple with this gray area the most are the survivors themselves. Um, and this is because violence happens within relationship. Um, and I have found that this has always been the hardest piece of my work with survivors. Um, has been the questions that kind of arise from this gray area. Uh, and the questions kind of look like, did he know what he was doing? Um, was it intentional? Can he change? It felt genuine. I really believed he was remorseful. Um, was I wrong to believe him? Um, and if we really kind of sit and reflect on these questions, what, what we can come to understand is these questions are not really about the perpetrator, um, but they are about the victim themselves. And so it's kind the questions arise in terms of a search for dignity um, and how this kind of search for dignity, dignity is intimately tied to experiences of shame. Um, so it's here in this realm of dignity and shame that the lines between perpetrator and victim um, begin to blur. So I just want to add a little caveat that I am using perpetrator predominantly um, from a male perspective and victim as um, predominantly from a female perspective. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that abuse is perpetrated in other ways. Um, but in terms of this presentation, I'm, I am looking at it through that gendered lens. Um, and I also, before we kind of move forward together, I want to preface the rest of the pre presentation by acknowledging that I'm going to be looking at um, how shame and the search for dignity is the binding thread in terms of experiences and perpetration of violence. Um, however, the complexities of this are really too great uh, to really dive into and do justice today. So I want to for us to keep in mind that we're really just skimming the surface of a lot of really complex subjects uh, and that there's a lot more that we could dig into. Um, and that although my presentation will explore um, shame and dignity from the perspective of a perpetrator, that these themes could equally be applied to the experiences of the survivors. And I think in fact, for true understanding to happen, um, this framework must be applied to both sides concurrently. Um, I chose to look at this from the perspective of the perpetrator um, based on my experience and work with the military currently um, and because I think it's a narrative which is seldom highlighted. We don't talk about it um, very often and I think um, doing so helps it shine a light more onto the experiences of shame of um, the survivors and as well informs our capacity um, to intervene in cases of family violence more effectively. So <clears throat> this is a quote by Judith Graham. Que la connexion et la déconnexion sont le noyau. Um, 
le noyau des relations humaines. La connexion et sa double déconnexion sont là où nous pouvons commencer si nous voulons intervenir dans le cycle de la violence si profondément ancré dans notre culture. So what we're going to be moving forward with is the idea of connection and disconnection um, as a space for intervention in terms of uh, preventing and intervening in the cycle of violence. And what I want to look at today is how shame is the mediating variable um, in this connection and disconnection. So what I have next is a clip um, from the landmark shame researcher, uh, Brene Brown. Um, and she's going to start us off by defining what shame is. And she's also going to call attention to three important points that I would like um, you to hold in your mind as we move forward. So one is the idea of me too and vulnerability. Donc moi aussi et la vulnérabilité. So how we need empathy um, to combat shame. So empathy for self and empathy for other. Um, and as well how shame thrives in environments of shame, silence and secrecy. Um, que la honte existe surtout dans des circonstances de silence, de secret et du jugement. The thing to understand about shame is it's not guilt. Shame is a focus on self, guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is I am bad, guilt is I did something bad. How many of you, if you did something that was hurtful to me, would be willing to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? How many of you would be willing to say that? Guilt, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Shame, I'm sorry, I am a mistake. There is a huge difference between shame and guilt. And here's what you need to know. Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. And here's what you even need to know more. Guilt, inversely correlated with those things. The ability to hold something we've done or failed to do up against who we want to be is incredibly adaptive. It's uncomfortable, but it's adaptive. If you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three things to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. If you put the same amount of shame in a Petri dish and douse it with empathy, it can't survive. The two most powerful words when we're in struggle, me too. And so I'll leave you with this thought. If we're going to find our way back to each other, vulnerability is going to be that path. So I'm just going to stop it there, maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, so shame has been called the master emotion um, because once it's internalized, all other emotions become bound by shame. And so what I mean by bound by shame is that our capacity to access um, and how and which emotions then become expressed are mediated by shame. So once shame has been internalized, there's actually this rupture um, within the self. Um, and so we have to develop protective strategies um, to combat this, this, this piece of our identity or this parts of ourselves which, which are shameful. So we're protecting it not only from the view of others, um, but also from the view of self. And so actually within shame, parts of the self um, become unknown to the self and disowned by the self. Um, and so if we're looking um, to understand what these strategies might look like in order to mediate the effects of shame, um, Harlington and colleagues, as well as Nathanson, um, looked at coping strategies in terms of mediating the, the effects of shame. Harlington did so within a relational perspective um, and Nathanson um, within a self perspective. So Harlington talks about how um, we may move away from others, towards others or against others um, as a way to mediate shame. And I think the easiest way to understand um, these strategies is in terms of looking at what this looks like in terms of relationship with the self. So Nathan, Nathanson talks about withdrawal of the self. So this is isolating and hiding and running. Um, and so this would be a lack of engagement, like a, a moving away from others in terms of relationship, not engaging in relationship. Um, attack of self, so putting oneself down, masochism, um, behaviors like self-harm are in that category. Um, then there's also avoidance, so denial, um, numbing, 
numbing type behaviors like using of drugs and alcohol, um, obsessive compulsive type disorders. Um, and then the final one is attack on other. So this is turning the tables, blaming the victim, um, and lashing out verbally or physically. And so depending on situation and a lot of like really complex variables kind of determines which strategy we're using in particular set of circumstances or within particular relationship with others. Um, but I would like to call our attention just to the attack on other. Um, and one of the greatest predictive variables there in terms of whether we're going to um, use attack on other as a mediator um, of shame is if we have power over another. Um, and so if we feel like um, the power imbalance is in our favor and when there is deep, deep, deep shame. Um, so when there is a very high degree of pain and shame and when we have power over others, um, this is when we are most likely to turn to the strategy of attack other. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, shame as being trauma-based, que la honte um, a une relation avec les traumatismes. And to understand um, shame as trauma-based, um, one of the biggest studies that has been done has been a study by Kaiser Permanente in 1995, looking at adverse childhood experiences um, and how they can be understood as um, related to and uh, related to future perpetration and victimization of violence. So if we look at the tree um, above ground, um, these are adverse childhood experiences which are occurring um, as children in relationships. And so these are traumas which are happening within relationships where there is already a power imbalance between adult and child, parent and child, um, however that um, kind of relationship looks like. And then if we look down below, um, the roots of the tree in terms of the adverse community environments, um, these experiences of trauma are born of a power imbalance um, where power and privilege is, un, uh, is unequally accessible depending on your, your um, membership in certain groups. So we can start to see how trauma is experienced throughout a lifetime um, uh, how, sorry, sorry, how shame starts to be born from traumas experienced throughout a lifetime. Um, and just also to touch on the fact that trauma is really defined as a feeling of powerless and helplessness when our systems have been overwhelmed, so we no longer feel like um, we're able to cope. So we start to see how power, shame, and trauma all start to intersect and um, be tied together in experience. So in order to understand how these um, adverse childhood experiences um, are related to layer perpetration and victimization of violence, I think it's easiest to, understood it, to understand it through a life course perspective. Um, and so this is where we understand violence um, within the context of previous experiences and the consequences of those previous experiences. Um, and I kind of look at consequence meaning um, what has been the outcome of those trauma experiences? Has there been reparation? Has there been healing? Or has it been left untouched? Um, and how that plays into um, the experience of trauma across the lifetime. Um, and as well as the developmental relational approach. So this is our understanding um, that trauma, trauma impacts us within relationships. And so developmentally and neurologically, um, there's a bi-directionality between relationship and development, and this is hugely influential um, in terms of our experiences of trauma and the impact later on in the future. So there's a lot um, of theories which kind of explain this impact of trauma throughout, develop, uh, throughout the lifespan, um, and they're listed on the table on the right. Um, they're there's far too many theories to really dig into and look today. Um, but if we just keep in mind to look at these theories through a life course perspective and a developmental relational approach, um, we can start to understand um, how they're related and how they influence one another. So I just want to take us to one more slide, which kind of is a summation of all of those slides in terms of trauma that we have just looked at. And it's looking at, you know, the intergenerational impact of trauma, the social conditions. So we were talking about the power imbalance um, in, at an environmental level, the adverse childhood experiences, 
how in many ways this cause, causes disrupted neural development, um, which impacts social, emotional, and cognitive development, and so on and so forth um, throughout the lifespan. So this is actually a quote from one of my mentors. Um, what is the function of the dysfunction? Dans quelle est la fonction de la dysfunction? So if we're looking at shame, trauma, adverse, child experience, adverse childhood experiences across the lifespan, um, we have to start looking at behavior as an adaptive strategy um, and how perhaps it once served a positive or protective function um, and how perhaps now um, it's no longer um, serving that adaptive function anymore and is actually perhaps causing harm in some way. So this is a cycle of shame and abuse where someone is experiencing some kind of emotional pain um, and then they're engaging in some substitutive behavior in order to numb the pain. This works for some time, but that substitutive behavior is not addressing the cause of the emotional pain. And so what we see is the pain intensifying again, re-engagement in a substitutive behavior to numb the pain and around and around this cycle goes. So we can see how our only way out of this cycle um, is to address the cause of the emotional pain. And I think this is a cycle um, which a lot of clinicians um, are quite familiar with. If we kind of go back and look at um, the shame compass, right? Um, and harm to self, that masochism end of the compass, you know, we're looking at self-harm behaviors, right? Where someone has experienced some kind of emotional pain, they're engaging in self-harm to numb the pain, the effect is, you know, eventually it subsides and around and around this goes. Same can be said for numbing behaviors like addiction. Um, but then when we move into perhaps explaining violence as a substitute of behavior, it tends to create some unease. There's some kind of cognitive dissonance around understanding um, violence is a use of in terms of moving away from emotional pain, um, but we can understand violence in terms of this cycle when we look at the shame compass in terms of attack towards others. Um, and I think this unease and this discomfort is really coming from um, that dichotomy that was created um, through the dominant ideologies, a very distinct class of perpetrator uh, and victim. And so our way out of this really um, in terms of looking at violence and emotional pain is to understand violence as emotional pain, um, which is, is coming from the bedrock of trauma and the shame associated with that trauma. And so when we're talking about interventions and the prevention of violence, um, we really need to be looking at and addressing the trauma and the associated shame um, and how it plays into this cycle. Sorry guys, I meant to preface that. Um, <laughs> so that is a clip um, from Frozen and it's talking about kind of holding in um, all the emotions and locking them away. Um, Frozen is actually a really wonderful parable um, for shame. Throughout the, it looks at shame in a lot of really beautiful ways. Um, and why I wanted to bring that forward was um, this idea of how our understanding of, of masculinity, particularly as it pertains to um, a, a social problem of toxic masculinity, uh, impacts our ability um, to address shame um, and for men to also look at their shame. And so it's impacting our ability to intervene in family violence effectively. So. Toxic masculinity is this idea that uh, to be a man, right, to be a man's man is to be emotionally strong, right? So there's a denial of emotion, a repression of emotion, um, and this kind of tucking away of parts of themselves because there isn't a safe way in which to express them. Um, because to express them would be to go counterculture of what it means to be a man. Uh, and so we can't keep all our emotions tucked in uh, and repressed. It's just not possible. And so there has to be some socially acceptable outlet for emotion. Um, and in the case of men, this has been uh, aggression. And so it's perfectly fine to um, kind of get your emotions out and to respond in violence because that 
goes in with our dominant ide ideologies of what it means to be a man um, and that men are strong and powerful um, and that there's this assumption that emotions are weakness and vulnerability, right? And so we can start to see how we're really constraining men um, in terms of, of being able to incorporate victimhood in terms of their experiences, right? So victimhood is really incompatible with notions of masculinity because the overarching message that men get is be strong, don't show it, vulnerability is weak. And so to engage in any kind of acknowledgement of victimhood, so of trauma, um, is extremely risky uh, for men because it, 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 it then is touching at the very root of their sense of identity. And so we run up against more shame. So we can't touch the shame <laughs> about um, the trauma because then we run into what it means to be a man in terms of our definitions of, of shame. So this is creating a situation in which we're really double bound um, in terms of our capacity to intervene in, um, in situations of family violence. So on one side, we have the monster narrative, right? So if you are someone who is abusive or engaging or using violence, um, you will be painted as a monster, um, which is extremely shameful, right? And then on the other side of things, um, to address your victim, your, your victimization, to address your trauma, you have to walk into that emotion. Uh, and to walk into that emotion is very unmanly. And so we hit up against more shame here. And so in the middle, what we're looking at um, is that cycle of shame and abuse that we were looking at before. So at the very top, I'm, I'm realizing you guys can't see where I'm pointing to. Uh, sorry about that. So at the very top is emotional pain. Um, over on to the right is the use of um, substitutive behaviors. Okay, well, I'm gonna welcome everybody back. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. We, as you can see, have Nicole back. And so over to you, Nicole. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to back up a little um, and remind everyone that we are kind of talking about the uh, cycle of trauma and shame um, and how we've kind of created uh, block points um, for perpetrators in terms of being able to access and address um, their trauma and shame mm -hmm. and kind of um, re-own those disowned parts of themselves. Okay. So if we look um, down at the lower stop sign, so the one to the, um, on the right, that is kind of where violence is being used. So attack of other, if we're talking about the shame compass or attack of other, if we're talking Was uh, Jasmine on that call as well? She was doing something else. And I said that we called my, Penny Ann had sent me the email yesterday. Uh, can I remind everyone to mute their microphones if they're not speaking? In her world. Um, mm. And Tammy does mistake as well. Nicole, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> we had to mute everyone because we were getting a lot of background noise. So Kim or um, uh, Nicole, I'm sorry about that. Could you just repeat the last sentence there? Oh, okay. Just found it. Um, yeah. So this is just in terms of the cycle of trauma and shame. I mean, how if we look at the bottom uh, stop sign there to the right, this is where use of violence um, within that cycle is used as a mechanism to distance um, from the emotional pain of the trauma and shame. Um, and how we've created a stop sign in terms of our capacity to really um, intervene in a meaningful way there. Um, because if we're addressing the abuse itself or the use of abuse and violence itself, um, it's requiring of the perpetrator um, almost a self-identification um, as a monster um, and kind of owning that narrative. 
Um, Nicole, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's quite a shaming, uh, it's a shaming way to, to own a piece of your identity. And so it really blocks effective intervention in that way. And, and then if we go around the circle and if we want to address the emotional pain itself, if we're talking about um, really looking at um, the root um, of the emotional pain, right? We're talking about trauma and shame and requiring a sense of um, vulnerability uh, to walk into that emo emotional space um, and to look at the trauma and how that impacts shame. Um, and to start to reown and look at pieces of the self which have been disowned because of that shame. And we've also, there's also a block there um, in terms of being able to access that space because then we run into toxic male um, culture and how to do so um, would be to run up against um, a really important piece of their uh, identity, their gender identity, um, because good men and men um, don't enter that space, that to enter that space and um, the and assuming your victim identity is shaming in and of itself. And so we can start to see how um, through a trauma-informed perspective um, that we're really constraining um, our capacity to intervene in a really meaningful way. Uh, and so if we kind of go back to the video by Brene Brown in terms of what does shame um, need, what is the antidote to shame? Um, it is this sense of vulnerability. Um, a space for self-empathy, um, as well as an empathy from another, um, and this, this narrative of me too, right? And so if we continue to classify perpetrators as the monster, there's no space for this me too. There's no space for the empathy. Um, and in that, there's no space for self-empathy. And so just to kind of close together, um, I'd like to just take a look at one other clip. Uh, and this is also a clip from another Disney movie. I'm sure you can guess that uh, from all these clips. I'm also a mom to a young child, um, but there's some really beautiful messages also hidden uh, in these in these movies. So I think it's a really powerful clip um, in showing how use of violence, right? Um, in the beginning, the big, the powerful, the loud, the attacking, um, and a space for intervention um, when we can see past the use of violence to something greater, to the pain underneath, um, and really tailor our interventions within that space. Um, I do want to be very clear um, that in this clip, Moana, so the, the one approaching um, the violence is not, um, it's not the person in relationship with another, but that is the person holding the space as a professional um, to do the intervention with someone um, who is in a space of um, being ready to look at their emotional pain or helping them get to a space and supporting them um, to be in a space of looking to their emotional pain. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to make sure that interpretation was really clear. Um, so that's kind of, that, that really is the end of my presentation. That's all um, I have space and time for today. And uh, I thank all of you for being here with me um, as we kind of look at shame and violence and how they intersect together. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for your presentation.